žalije, kaž no zelene, ali te si žalije, če ne polublije, ali te to žalije, kaž le vent l'amene, ali prije rabije, et le vent me disait Elle est bien trop jolie Et toi, toi je te connais L'aimer toute une vie Tu ne pourras jamais Oui mais elle est partie C'est bête mais c'est vrai Elle était si jolie, je n'oublierai jamais. Aujourd'hui c'est l'automne et je pleure souvent. Aujourd'hui c'est l'automne, qu'il est loin le printemps, dans le parc où frissonne. Sa robe tourbillonne, puis elle disparaît. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present one of America's best-selling authors, and uh, you mention this woman's name, and you're in for a very vigorous conversation, especially among her untold, uncounted numbers of followers. Here is philosopher Ayn Rand. Miss Rand. Nice hand. Um, America, because I think most men here are repressors. They hide their feelings, particularly. <laughs> Thank you. How do we have this, we have this dual set of behavior uh, standards? Yes, and it's sort of weakness. It's not strength. What, what more wonderful embracing have we ever seen than the hockey players gave each other when they defeated Russia? Uh, because he is a defender, upholder, and advocate of reason. Aristotle. Aristotle, and the father of logic. Plato is the opposite. Yeah. So let's just basically say what objectivism is. Okay? And make a long speech about it? Oh, not too long, no. No, because that's terribly difficult, you know. To begin with, it's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's a philosophic system. And philosophy is the science that studies the basic nature of existence. How does, quote, I fit into the philosophy of objectivism? How does objectivism relate to me, the individual? What well, does it do for me? Are you a human being? Mm -hmm. Well, then it relates to you. It tells you how to lead your life and how to achieve things, how to be happy. It tells you the fundamental principles by which you can make your own choices. How does objectivism differ from the philosophies that many of us have been exposed to in our youths? Uh, philosophies based upon religions, theologians, dogmatists. The f very first difference. Uh, objectivism tells you that it is not right it is not proper to men to take anything on faith. Now, then you believe this for yourself, do you not? You, you accept this philosophy. Oh, it certainly. has guided your life, it has... Yes. Inside, there is an operator who speaks no Chinese. When a message is pushed in, a tedious but well-defined procedure begins. He looks each of the characters up in a book. Each character is cross-referenced for the particular context in which it is found. The references refer to cards on which the characters of the answer are written. The operator is ignorant of any meaning of the symbols. He is just following the instructions in the book. There is no reason for him to know that the signs in the drawers are even part of a language. Symbols are being manipulated according to rules. This is doing the same thing as a computer. 
But this computer has apparently solved all the problems of AI. The rules it operates on do make it seem to behave intelligently. But the point of the story is that following these rules hasn't made the operator understand Chinese, and it never will. Computers deal with numbers, and the complex calculations they carry out are the result of their ability to do many simple, ordinary sums with speed and accuracy. They can store numbers until required. And they can also do simple logical operations such as selection. For example, they can determine which is the larger of two numbers. Sigmund Freud was the pioneer who first tried to explore empirically the unconscious background of consciousness. He worked on the general assumption that dreams are not a matter of chance, but are associated with conscious thoughts and problems. This assumption was not in the least arbitrary. It was based upon the conclusion of eminent neurologists, for instance, Pierre Janet, that neurotic symptoms are related to some conscious experience. They even appear to be split-off areas of the conscious mind, which at another time and under different conditions can be conscious. Before the beginning of this century, Freud and Josef Breuer had recognized that neurotic symptoms, hysteria, certain types of pain, and abnormal behavior, are in fact symbolically meaningful. They are one way in which the unconscious mind expresses itself, just as it may in dreams, and they are equally symbolic. A patient, for instance, who is confronted with an intolerable situation may develop a spasm whenever he tries to swallow. He can't swallow it. Under similar conditions of psychological stress, another patient has an attack of asthma. He can't breathe the atmosphere at home. A third suffers from a peculiar paralysis of the legs. He can't walk, that is, he can't go on any more. A fourth, who vomits when he eats, cannot digest some unpleasant fact. I could cite many examples of this kind, but such physical reactions are only one form in which the problems that trouble us unconsciously may express themselves. They more often find expression in our dreams. Do you think that that gave you an extra strength in your life? Oh, I don't know. No, I shouldn't have said so. Neither, neither extra strength nor the opposite. I mean, I was just engaged in the pursuit of knowledge. As you um, approach the uh, end of life, do you have any fear of some kind of afterlife, or do you feel that that is just an no, impossibility? No, no, I think that's nonsense. There is no afterlife? None, whatever. No. Do you have any fear of something that uh, is common amongst atheists and agnostics who have been atheists or agnostics all their lives, I object to the idea that people have the right to vote on everything. The traditional American system was a system based on the idea that majority will prevail only in public or political affairs, and that it was limited by inalienable individual rights. Therefore, I do not believe that a majority can vote a man's life or property or freedom away from him. And therefore, I do not believe that if a majority votes on any issue, that this makes the issue right. It doesn't. All right. Then how do we arrive at action? How should we arrive at action? By voluntary consent, voluntary cooperation of free men, unforced. And how do our leaders arrive? How do we arrive at our leadership? Who elects? Who appoints? Uh, the whole people elects. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the democratic process in politics. Uh, we arrive at it the way we arrived by the American Constitution as it used to be. By the constitutional process as we had it, uh, people elect officials, but the powers of those officials, the powers of government are strictly limited. They will have no right 
to initiate force or compulsion against any citizen except a criminal. Uh, those who have initiated force will be punished by force, and that is the only proper function of government. What we would not permit is the government to initiate force against people who have hurt no one, who have not forced anyone. We would not give the government or the majority or any minority the right to take the life or the property of others. That was the original American system. When you say it, take the property of others, I imagine that you're talking now about taxes. Yes, I am. And you believe that there should be no right by the government to tax. You believe that there should be no such thing as welfare legislation, unemployment compensation, regulation during times of stress, certain kinds of rent controls and things like that. That's right. I'm opposed to all forms of control. I am for an absolute laissez-faire, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I'm for the separation of state and economics. Just as we had separation of state and church, which led to peaceful coexistence among different religions after a period of religious wars, so the same applies to economics. If you separate the government from economics, if you do not regulate production and trade, you will have peaceful cooperation and harmony and justice among men.